Mickey, first of all, thank you so much for coming today and uh, oh, talking yeah. to us. Thank you very much for coming to Muscle Shoals, and always glad to meet a friend, man. You know. Thank you. This has been a wonderful trip because I love the tradition of the music from Muscle Shoals and, and uh, all the tradition that, uh, that, that comes with that, going back to W.C. Handy and being part of the, the, the W.C. Handy Festival. And then, of course, all those incredible records, um, songwriters, musicians, uh, singers, everybody that came out of here, out of the Fame Studios and Muscle Shoals Sound Studios. Uh, but then to be surprised to find that there's still a real vitality here today. Oh, um, yeah with some of the wonderful veterans and pioneers, but also there's there's so much new music going on and so much energy. We've uh, got so much young blood. Man, it's, it's, it is so thrilling to me because for a little period there, there was a lull, and it's like, man, is anybody going to pick the torch up and run with it? You know, and and everybody was, they were... They were woodshedding at home in the bedrooms, but they weren't coming out and putting bands together and playing. And, I mean, we we started thinking, I don't know. And then, bam, all of a sudden, all these great new talent comes out of the woodwork. You know, the the Secret Sisters and the Jason Isbells and the blah, blah, blahs and on and on, you know. And, and man, it's just busting out all over Muscle Shoals now, you know. And I'm so happy they're carrying it on. Yeah. Mickey, one of the things that uh, uh, I was uh, interested in finding out about, looking at those very early credits of, of the things that were going on uh, at the studios here, was that so many people would be engineers, producers, like Rick Hall would be engineering his own sessions. That's correct. And, uh, and so many other people would be writers and co-writers and playing on the sessions mm -hmm. and uh, involved in so many other parts, the business parts of uh, this, uh, including publishing and... Mm -hmm. Um, it was a, a real incubator for multiple talents, it seemed, uh, it, especially uh, when you came here. What was your first function here? Well, you know, like I say, this is my home. My intent in the beginning was, you know, was I was out there with my band, you know, uh, playing gigs. And, and we had three singles out, two of them on ADCO, you know, had a Southeastern hit on the first record we did over at Quinn Ivey's old studio where, the, where Percy cut When a Man Loves a Woman. But I wanted to get in the studio end of it. I wanted in there, man, at Fame, because I knew what was going on, and I just wanted in. And then I, you know, and I found out through David Hood and Jimmy that Rick really needed an assistant. He really needed some help because it had a lot going on, starting to get a lot going on. And he really had no employees. Jimmy Johnson was there to help him some with uh, some of the custom engineering, you know, on the weekends and at night and whatever. And that's all the help he had. And then he, uh, you know, got a secretary and, and kind of got busy getting some help. But they talked to Rick about me. They said, there's this guy, man, he's a talented guy, and he does this and that, and he does a lot of things. But he's interested and. In, uh you need, to, you need to hire him. So I went down and hung out, met Rick, and hung out several nights at different sessions. And finally, they talked him into hiring me. And I went to work as his assistant, doing anything and everything. And, and it was basically his assistant engineer, which I did for many years after I quit doing all the other the gophering, you know. Uh, my job was to be Rick's assistant engineer. And I assisted him on all of his projects as a second engineer. And, uh, you know, I was a tape loader and the whole thing and kept up with, I was production coordinator. I'd get the musicians booked and make sure everything was happening and everything was working and, you know, and I did all the custom sessions, anything Rick wasn't producing that came in, I engineered, whatever, you know. And then I signed as a uh, exclusive songwriter with Fame. And when I had time, I was doing that, writing songs, you know. And then uh, I later, went on to start producing projects uh, for different labels there at Fame, you know, and uh, playing on sessions. I played on, on all of Rick's sessions as well. There'd be days when I'd be in the control room half the time and then run out and play live on the track, you know, on a song and then run back in the control room. I mean, you know, I just did a little bit of everything. Yeah. And then did a lot of overdubbing later, you know, the percussion, so hand drums and stuff, you know. Sure. But... Uh, 
Yeah. You know, I just wanted in, and I, I started at the bottom working with Rick and learned what I could learn from Rick and Jimmy Johnson, and then later got to work, of course, with the great Tom Dowd uh, and learned a lot from Tom and Jerry Wexler, you know, there at Fame, you know, behind the console, and uh, just started playing sessions, you know, a lot later on when I when I really just got tired of engineering, you know. I, I managed Rick's studio, and, and I managed and ran Bill Lowry's studio in Atlanta, was a staff producer there. Uh, I went to Memphis for Rick and ran the Fame studio in Memphis, was the manager and the chief engineer there, and, and uh, worked with all the songwriters, you know, and, and uh, just tried to develop songwriters and get all the good songs down and get them down to down to fame, you know, for the for all the projects. Yeah. Because we project wrote most of the time. When, when we knew Rick, Rick would let us know what the next project was going to be, who was coming in, and everybody would really concentrate on writing songs for that specific artist. And we'd demo them as close to that artist, even down to finding somebody that could sound like them. I mean, we really worked as project writers for a long time, you know. So... So many of the uh, Dan Penn uh, demos have been reissued uh, in the last uh, few years. Were you yeah. involved in those? You know, Dan was there just, bef just before I was. I mean, I was still, I was, I'd, I'd come to work while Dan and Spoon were still there and still writing. Uh, but I didn't get to work with Dan and Spoon very much before they, they left. I mean, their contracts were up and they left and went to Memphis. You know, and then later to Nashville. What were some of the first uh, big records that, that you were part of, and what did you have to do with them? Oh, well, man, it was like day one, bam. Etta James. Tell Solomon Mama. Burt. I mean, you know, Wilson Pickett. I mean, I'm, I'm in the studio with my heroes, setting up microphones and running around, and I'm, I'm in the studio engineering and hooking up mics and whatever to the guy, the songs that I've been singing for the past five years with my band out there, you know, <laughs> fraternity parties and on the road up and down all over the southeast, and I'm in there with my heroes, and they're singing. And I mean, that's and I'm flipping out, man. I mean, you know, uh, it was quite a quite a thrill. And I mean, it was like from day one, the the greatest of the greatest. I'm in there working with. I mean, you know, it yeah. don't get bigger than those people, you know. Sure. And then Otis came in producing Arthur Connolly, and I got to be around Otis, you know, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. I mean, man, what a guy. You know, it really was true. You didn't have to see Otis Redding to know he was in the room. You could feel him come in. There was a presence about him that was just uncanny. And I wish he could have lived because he would have been another Barry Gordy. There's no question in my mind. You know, working with Arthur Connolly and Otis producing that session, what was what would you describe his production style? Oh man, he was he was great. He was so good with artists, but I mean, he rode Arthur like a child. I mean, he he crawled him and he hollered at him and he bitched at him and I, I mean, because he knew what Arthur could do and he knew Arthur wasn't giving it all. And boy, he gave him up and down the road till he got the very best out of him. He didn't cut him any slack at all. <laughs> he really didn't. <laughs> he got the very best out of him. Yeah. But I mean, Otis could have been and would have been a great, great record producer when he decided to come off the road and, and back off some. I'm sure that's what he would have done. And he just had a great way of getting a great performance out of an artist, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. As a songwriter, um, could you talk about some of the uh, the songs that you were involved, how how they were evolved and, and how they evolved and, and eventually uh, came down? Well, my biggest song, and it was the largest song in the Fame catalog up until Gary Baker's uh, song, uh, my song and Barbara Wyrick's, we co-wrote a song called Tell Me a Lie, which was the biggest song in the Fame catalog up until I swear, and it's still the second largest song in the catalog. Uh, I have a millionaire award on that song from BMI, as a matter of fact. Barbara and I wrote that song, co-wrote the song. 
The first cut was on Sammy Joe, who I and Sonny Limbo produced, and it became a giant pop hit record, and the album was huge. And then we later, some years later, had a number one country record on Janie Fricky on that same song, and this had multiple covers. But we were signed to fame at the time when we wrote yeah. that song. Then George Jackson and I, who were great, great friends, and my favorite songwriter to write, co-write with was yeah. George. And we were both signed to fame, and George Jackson and I wrote a lot of songs together and got a lot of cuts together. And one of them was a song called Double Lovin', which we got on the Osmonds, and it was a top 10 pop hit. It was on, it was on the Homemade album, and I had four cuts on that album as a writer. And uh, like I say, George and I cut, had a lot of cuts. We got a lot of R&B cuts that made the R&B charts, didn't get in the pop charts, but we were, you know, custom writing for these artists, you know. And a lot of them were Malico artists. But later on, you know, uh, we wrote other songs for, but that's, that's the way we worked. And uh, the Etta James cut, I got, I mean, like I say, it was just bam. Etta James comes in when I first go to work there, needing songs. Barry Beckett and Rick Hall and I wrote a song called uh, uh, I Can't Love Without You Just Ain't No Way. I'm pretty sure that's it. And Etta cut it. And it was B-side to Tell Mama. And I start off my writing career there getting a cut on Etta James. I mean, you know, I'm going, all right. <laughs> you know, and, and of course we tried hard to get, Rick would, of course, want to cut as many songs as he could on the artist out of his own publishing company. If we had the good songs, and he cut them. If they weren't, then he'd cut somebody else's. He was always looking for the best song, no matter where it came from. Mm -hmm. But we tried to write hits for all his artists, you know. <laughs> and... Later on, we got a lot of them cut that he didn't produce, you know. Was blues a big influence on you, like when you were, uh, when you had your band originally? And oh, yeah, been... man. Yeah, Jimmy Reed was, Jimmy Reed and Bo Diddley and, and John Lee are my, my, my mentors, man. You know, and, you know, we, we all grew up loving the blues and listening to John R., WLAC in Nashville, you know, and. I've been spending the last three or four weeks. I've been pulling out a bunch of old stuff and listening to to uh, uh, T Bone Walker and revisiting all the T Bone stuff, man. You know, and just I still just love that stuff. Sure. And we cut. Uh, I had the great fortune to record uh, Al, I mean Mike Bloomfield, and Nick Gravanides came to town and brought Otis Clay. And we did an album at Fame. I engineered it. Hmm. And, of course, Otis Clay was just a fantastic player and singer, and that was a wonderful experience, you yeah. know. And they loved the studio so much, they wouldn't go to the hotel rooms. They just wanted to sleep in the studio. I said, that's fine. Of course, we worked most of the time anyway, but they, they slept in the studio, you know. <laughs> and, of course, Malico had uh, Little Milton and Bobby Blue Bland. Uh, did sure. Yeah, we and Johnny that? Taylor and yeah. all, and we got cuts on all of those, you know. I mean, I've, I've had cuts and played on on all those records, you know. Uh, uh, the one interesting thing, they called me one day, I was at home, they called me from sound and said, Mickey, we need, a, we need a scratch vocal on a song for Blue Bland. We got a demo here, but the guy really can't sing it. And Bobby's not here, but we got the key. Run down here and do this vocal. So I went down, they gave me they gave me like two listens through on a cassette thing, you know. And I'm supposed to sing for Bobby Blue Bland, right? You know, who's one of my heroes. I listened to it and did the best I could. We got right down on the end and Wolf Stevenson sitting in the control room, you know, by the engineer. And we get right down to the end. I said, look, I got to put my little signature on there for Bobby. And I went, wow. You know, right, <laughs> right on the end. And Wolf jumped back in the chair, man. He looked out there at me and I just laughed. I said, Bobby's probably going to die when he hears that, but I had to do it. But, but they, you know, we, yeah. we got the demo, got the track cut, and they put Bobby on it, and it was a good record. 
<laughs> and I had a good time. I wish I'd have had more time to learn song and do it yeah. better, you know. Did you ever work with Clarence Carter? All of his stuff. All of it. I was either playing on it live or, in, or as, as assistant with Rick in the control room. I used to stand behind Clarence before he used to do all of his stuff in Braille. I used to stand because we wouldn't have time to learn them and wouldn't have time to get them, you know, Braille them out. So I would stand behind Clarence, right behind his right ear, and hold the lyrics, and I'd whisper. And it always amazes me. He's singing a line that I just told him while he's listening to the next line that I'm telling him in his ear <laughs> without getting me on the mic. And that was a real challenge, but we got it down to a fine art. Mm -hmm. And I did that a million times with Clarence, you know. And I used to go get him at the hotel room, and Clarence always had his road suits on. I mean, that's, he's, he'd be coming off the road to, to come record. These multicolored suits, you know, have them hanging in his closet. And he'd be getting ready to come over to the studio to record. And I'm going, all right, now I'm going to watch this. How's he going to know what color coat to put on with these yellow pants he just put on? Because he's got green and red and blue. And he goes over and puts the yellow coat on. And I'm going, how does he know that, man? And I finally asked him, I said, Clarence, how did you know what color to put on? And he said, well, Mickey, I can't see hardly at all, but I can if there's plenty of light coming in the window. I can see a little bit of color, just a little bit. So, you know, but I never could figure that out, and I had to find out because somebody could really play a dirty joke on him and mismatch him up, <laughs> being mean to him, you know, and... But I loved Clarence Carter, man. He was the sweetest guy, and he could play, boy. You know, he could really play. One person I would have loved to have met uh, was Arthur Alexander. Um, his warm voice, uh, the songwriting style that he had, yeah. just seemed like such a, a, a wonderful, friendly person. He was the warmest guy, and everybody that ever knew him loved him. And I didn't get a chance to know him well. Donnie Fritz knew him real well. When you talk to Donnie, you can find out all about Arthur. But he was a giant guy, you know, but he was, what a good singer. And such the sweetest, nicest guy you're ever going to meet, man. You know, I wish I could have been around him more and gotten to know him more. But he wasn't coming around fame when I was there, which was 67. Late 66, early 67 is when I started at fame. Yeah. And... You know, they had done that stuff prior to that. Yeah. Well, Jerry Wexler certainly made a huge difference to this community when, when he came. He's the godfather. He's the yeah. godfather of Muscle Shoals. Yeah. So you you were there the first few times he came? Oh, yeah, man. And I love Jerry. Love him. I miss him. I miss him so much. I, I worked with him a lot. Learned a lot from him. And he did me a great honor when he cut Bob Dylan's the last album he produced on Bob Dylan, down in the, down at the river, down at 1000 Alabama Avenue, at Muscle Shoals Sound. He cut the album on Dylan. He he used just a couple of Shoals players. You know, he brought in players from from everywhere. Well, he called me and asked me, would I like to come down and play on Bob Dylan album? I said, Jerry Wex, are you kidding me, man? When? He said, now. I said, I'm on my way. And I grabbed all my stuff and threw it in the car and went down. And they were they had already cut the tracks. He wanted me to overdub on some tracks. It was just he and Bob and the engineer. And, you know, we worked all day, you know, overdubbing. He had some ideas, and I had some ideas, and we, we did our thing. And and uh, he was very happy with what he got, and Bob was happy with what we, we got and everything. And I told him later on, I, I, the last time I saw him was out at the Hall of Fame at an event. I said, Jerry, I just want to thank you again, man, for, for calling me to play on that Dylan album because you've worked with and could have called any and every of the greatest percussionists in the world to play on this. And he said, I called you because you got the best feel and I wanted you. And I said, man, that's enough for me. That's all I need to know. You know, <laughs> that was slow train coming. Yes, I can't let you go without asking about Dwayne Allman. 
mm. and uh, his um, influence on the whole Muscle Shoals scene and and uh, the great music that he made. And you were there when it yes, happened. Um, what are your memories of that time? Well, you know, he wasn't there long, but man, just Dwayne is is just Dwayne Alwyn. There's, there's never been anybody like him. I admire him in so many levels. Most people admire him for his playing ability. I admire him for his free spirit more than anything else because I saw in him a spirit that I'd give anything if I had half of because he was wide open for life, just wide open. He was all business about his music. No fooling around, you know. He was all business. But man, the rest of the time, life was what it was, and it was his peach, man, and he ate it. But I asked him one time. I went in the studio, and he was just in there by himself. There was nothing going on, and he was just playing. He, he always was playing when he wasn't recording or working. He was always playing, just by himself. And I went up to him, I said, Dwayne, give me your take on, your theory on setting up your guitar in the amp. He said, man, it's real simple. Turn the amp on and turn everything wide open. And that's what he did. Everything on his guitar, he was playing a Strat then, and everything on the amp wide open. And that's my theory. And of course, we, wouldn't, we couldn't let him play loud on sessions. He never got to play as loud as he liked to play. And the truth be known, Dwayne was a live player at heart. He wasn't a session player, but he could play with anybody, anytime, anywhere. You know that. But his forte was turning that sucker up and burning, you know. And I just, I was so busy when they were over in Studio B with Rick trying to get some stuff on tape with the beginnings of what became the Allman Brothers. I was so busy cutting other sessions and doing custom work, and hey, I never got to go over and spend a lot of time with them hanging, you know. But I did get to spend some time with him out of the studio and around at night some. And he was just, just a sweetheart guy, man. <laughs> and, I, you know, I just loved being around him. And he was, uh, he, when he came to town, it was warm weather. But, of course, then it, then it got cold. He didn't have a coat to his name. And I had a Navy pea coat, and I just took it off and gave it to him. I said, here, you need a coat, brother. And it wasn't long after that that Wexler called him to New York to play on some Aretha stuff, I think. And I had another coat at home. So when he gets through with that and he comes back to town, he's got this funky old sheepskin thing on the inside, and it was some kind of leather on the outside, and it was ragged and whatever, but it was, you know, it was a cool coat. I said, well, where's your pea coat, brother? He said, oh, I traded it for this, man, on this guy on the street up there in New York. <laughs> that was Dwayne, you know. I said, well, it's cool, you know. But that was him, man. But, you know, I... There's a night or two I'd, I'd, I'd be just exhausted and be wanting, just needed a friend, and I'd go to the hotel room, knock on the door, it'd be 2 or 3 in the morning. Dwayne would get up, man, turn the light on and say, well, come on, let's talk about it. Let's just sit down and talk about it. You know, and he'd, he'd fire one up and, and we'd talk, you know. And he was always there for his friends, man. Were you there when Wilson Pickett and uh, Dwayne Allman did uh, Hey Jude? Absolutely, and that's a memorable experience I'll never forget. Everybody had gone to lunch. It was a lunch break. We were trying to talk him into doing the song, and he said, I ain't doing no Beatles song. I mean, he just couldn't hear himself doing it. And Dwayne said, oh, yeah, man, this would be great. This would be great, Wilson. I'm standing right there by Dwayne and Pickett over here. Dwayne's standing by his amp. Pickett's standing right there. He said, look, here's how we'll do it. And he starts playing all these really, really the stuff, the high stuff that he played on the end of the record, you know, playing all this high stuff, you know, and, and showing him the groove, how he felt the groove. And right then and there, Pickett goes, Sky Man, Sky Man. And that's where he got the name, Sky Man. But his band used to call Dwayne Dog. So they just changed it to Sky Dog. But he was Sky Man from that day on, right then and there. Dwayne talked him into recording that song when he showed him what he was going to do on the guitar and Pickett went crazy and the rest is history, you know. And some people have called that the beginning of Southern rock. Yeah, well, it was. It really was. I mean, of course, there's pockets that'll argue with that, but, I mean, really and truly, that 
in my opinion, it was, you know. And, of course, Johnny Salmon took them, you know, and ran with them and cut some wonderful product down in Macon, and Johnny's a dear friend. And he was part of all that, and they made some wonderful music, man. Wonderful. Well, Mickey, thank you so much for sitting down with us today and, oh, uh, and sharing these amazing stories. I'm always so happy that you guys come to town from any and everywhere to come to Muscle Shoals and just get with us, you know, and and get to know you and see what y'all are up to and just spread the gospel, man, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. And please come oh, back. Thank you. Come so back much, when Mickey. you can stay a while and hang, you know? Yeah.